This time I'll invite you to open your Bibles with me, and we'll read from Revelation chapter 1, and we'll read the first eight verses. Revelation chapter 1, and we'll read eight verses. With God's word open before us, let's take a moment and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Your word that is God-breathed, that speaks to us and speaks to your church throughout all time. And Lord, as we're about to embark on a series through the book of Revelation, a book that sometimes we find difficult, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. We pray that the, the message of Revelation would come through loudly and clearly so that it changes the way that we live, as all Scripture does. Lord, send your Spirit in our midst. We, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us uh, from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve as God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is who uh, and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we get in to, to before we get into Revelation, I just thought we'd start thinking about this this way. I, I wonder if uh, you have ever been to a symphony or an orchestra. If if you have, you know what it's like, and you've seen a seen a performance. If you haven't, you know the kind of music that we're talking about. Uh, there are many different instruments, and each instrument has a different uh, score in front of them. A different, the music looks different than all the others. And as the music starts, you can hear one instrument and another, and they're all doing different things. It is complex, and, and there's a lot of moving parts through it. And that music, when it's played well, if you're there in the concert hall, that music can move you and it can uh, move you to tears. It can toss and turn emotions if you let that music uh, move through you. And despite everyone playing different music or different parts, there is a melody that you can follow through the score. There is something, a sound, a refrain that constantly anchors you. And I think this is a good way to think about the book of Revelation as we go, and I'll explain that. Many people are intimidated by the book or overwhelmed by it. When you open its pages, it seems so different and so foreign and so hard to understand. We might have a picture in our heads of, of fire and destruction, of rapture and antichrist, and you might be surprised to know that there is no rapture in the book of Revelation, and it never uses the word antichrist. We might think that in order to understand Revelation in any profitable way, we need to have advanced degrees. I read a story this week about some people in seminary, and they were in a class about something and they left they left the classroom and they saw the janitor and the janitor was reading the bible and so they asked him what he was reading and he said well i'm reading the book of revelation 
And they said, well, that's, that's too hard. And so they tried to direct him to some other place. He said, you won't understand what you're reading in that book. The implication being only someone who had a seminary degree could understand what was in that book. And the janitor looked at them and, and he said, I understand it perfectly. Jesus wins. Why are we intimidated? I think we're intimidated because there's some pretty fantastic views out there and uh, interpretations of Revelation. There's uh, things that are downright scary that some people say about Revelation. And G.K. Chesterton, he, he said this. He said, Though St. John saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. I like that one a lot. Think about how this happens and why this happens. And maybe you know the kind of interpretations I'm talking about. But listen, when, when we take a book of the Bible, any book, we understand something about that book. We understand that it is written for us, but not to us. Right? We understand that. It's written to other people a long time ago, but for our benefit. So the book of Romans is written to the church of Rome, to, to the people who were living there in that context for our benefit. We still gain spiritual insight and understanding into who God is and who we are through the book of Romans. The book of Luke is written to Theophilus, but again, it's, it's written to him in his context in that time, but it is written for our benefit. It continues to bless the church. The book of Genesis was written to the people of Israel, again, for our benefit. To understand those books and to understand what they're saying for the church throughout time, we have to understand the context, the, the world that they lived in, the culture, the choices before them, their day-to-day -day life, their spiritual s struggles, and so on. And so anytime we take any book, there's some struggle to understand that, that context. When we get to Revelation, the trouble is that some people insist that it was written to us and for us. That is, the images in the book, they only make sense in our own day. The argument then is that the church has held on to this book for 2,000 years without really understanding it and no hope of understanding it. But now we do because we can, we can finally apply the image of a particular creature to this particular nation or that nation that was never there when the book was written. And that locusts are clearly helicopters that the people then wouldn't have understood that, but now we can understand that. And the beast is clearly a, a president, a world leader, or whatever. And the mark of the beast is clearly a barcode, a microchip, or a vaccine. It only applies in the time of the interpreter, in the time in which the interpreter lives, and it's always about the things that he or she sees on the news cycle. That means that the people of John's day would have gained very little from the book because they didn't have the European Union or Facebook and Twitter or COVID or Trudeau or whatever else you want to do. And people have been interpreting that, that, the, the book of Revelation that way since Montanus and about 300 who insisted that where he lived was the place where the heavenly Jerusalem would come in, down because he understood the book of Revelation as only applying to his day. And, the, and people have not stopped doing that. But take heart, brothers and sisters, because just like every other book in the Bible, Revelation is not written to us but for us. So, and, that, and so that will require work, but not, not the kind of work that makes the book only applicable to today. It takes the same kind of work that we do with any other book of the Bible. That is, we need to understand what's going on in the lives of people to whom it is written. The interpretation of Revelation is not unhinged from the way we read the rest of Scripture. It uses the same principles it is the same God, the same Holy Spirit who inspires. The second reason that we might be intimidated uh, by the book of Revelation is because of the kind of writing it is. It's apocalyptic. And the way that we use that word today is very different from the way that John used that book, or that word rather. 
We use it, we think of terror and destruction and aliens and nuclear bombs and the end of the world and zombies and all these sorts of things. There's a whole genre of apocalyptic literature and movies and so on that have co-opted this word uh, to make it mean a total destruction, the end of the world. When, when John uses it, it's actually the very first word of the book. And it's, it says in Greek, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And he means something, the word means something like an unveiling, a revealing. John is about to reveal to a struggling church what is happening behind the scenes. I'll talk more about apocalyptic literature on a Sunday evening uh, because it has its own rules, a little bit of interpretation that are different than reading a gospel. And that's, uh, we understand that intuitively. You don't read a history book in the same way that you read science fiction literature, right? We, We know that there's different rules to understanding it. You'll have to stay tuned for that. But the point is, John is saying, look, what I'm about to do is sort of to, to talk to this struggling church that is undergoing persecution, and I'm going to pull back the veil so that you can see what's happening in heaven and so that you can find comfort and strength to persevere. We'll see that as we go through. Maybe a third reason that we're intimidated by the book of Revelation is that there is so much imagery. And maybe... What's wonderful about the book of Revelation is as we read these things, maybe we have a vague sense that we've seen it before. And that's because the imagery comes from the Old Testament. And so to really understand Revelation, you have to know which well John is is drawing from. Of the 404 verses of Revelation, at least 278 a reference or allude to Old Testament passages. So almost, almost what, what is that? Almost three quarters of the verses allude to the Old Testament. And that's important. That, I mean, John, as he's writing, he thinks the Old Testament is very relevant, of course. And, and all these images then come from there. Just in our opening passage, the first eight verses, there are allusions to Daniel 2, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 41, Isaiah 61, Zechariah 12, Genesis 49, Exodus 19, and Psalm 89. Maybe you didn't notice them in there. You could go back and look. John often alludes throughout this book of Revelation to passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah and Jeremiah, Joel, Daniel, Exodus, Leviticus, and the Psalms. And finding those cross-references help us. I'll give an example of that. But it helps us to, to read the book with the, the simple rule then, as we, as we understand that the simple rule that the Old Testament controls the imagery since all the imagery comes from the Old Testament. We want to understand what, what the image means that John is using. We can look back in the Old Testament and find it and see what it means there. That can give us hope then as we embark on a journey through Revelation It will help us read and understand Revelation and understand that it is deeply enmeshed with the rest of the Bible because it has as its author God himself. It is not separate from the rest of the Bible. The Old Testament then controls the imagery. The second rule for understanding Revelation is that Revelation does in fact use symbolism. Now, some, that might surprise some of you, and that might not surprise others of you. Um, some people talk about reading Revelation literally, and, I, and I'm not sure what that means, because um, obviously there's lots of symbolism in there. But we know that John actually tells us that what he's about to do is he's going to use a lot of symbolism. If you had um, the Greek version of the Old Testament, so in the New Testament, a lot of the authors used the Greek version of the New Testament, a Greek Greek version of the Old Testament. And so if you could have that and you could read it, I'd ask you to open to Daniel 2. And there you would read that Daniel is speaking and he says, God is the one who reveals mysteries which he has shown concerning what will take place, which he has symbolized to the king. And Daniel 2 is this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. We, we talked about it in Advent, actually. It's this dream of the statue with all the different metals, and the, the Babylonian kingdom is gold on top, and, and then there's others. 
And then King Nebuchadnezzar sees this stone uncut by the hands of man come in and hit the feet of this statue and it falls apart and blows away into dust. And then that small rock, it becomes bigger and bigger and becomes a great mountain and it's the kingdom, it's the kingdom of God. So when Daniel's explaining that, he says, God reveals mysteries which he has shown concerning what will take place, which he has symbolized to the king. And Daniel, or the NIV, our opening, is, follows exactly that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God has gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending, he made it known by sending his uh, angel to his servant John. To make known, that word to make known in Daniel uses, uh, that Daniel uses and John copies means to symbolize, to signify. And so John tells us that what is about to follow will use symbols and pictures to convey a message. That is our default then, to look at the power and the meaning of symbol to pass on God's truth. The third rule is to understand the context, of course. This church that in John's world, in the, in the world of Revelation, is really struggling. He writes the letter to the seven churches in Asia, and there's an intentionality about that. There are, these seven churches exist in Asia at that time, but there are more than seven churches in that area in modern day Turkey. Uh, and some of the other letters of the New Testament are written to churches in that same geography. So why does John pick these seven? Certainly some of them weren't even the, the biggest churches around, but he picks these seven. And are, are these the ones who are going through the most persecution? No. Nope. John picks these seven churches as representatives of the universal church. But these are actual churches. These are actual people going through the struggles that they are going through. The point is that Christians are in a world in which they are not welcome. They are being persecuted either overtly or subtly, and they no longer feel at home. In all these cities, too, we find these temples dedicated to the emperor and his family. And people of Asia, of Turkey, they were required to go and worship at these temples to prove their loyalty to Caesar. How, the best way to show loyalty to, to Caesar is to worship him. And the people of these cities then were encouraged to do so. And if you didn't worship the emperor, and if you didn't worship the other gods of these cities, you were an outcast. You weren't welcome into the, the, the markets, which often you had to pay to offer an offering to the gods to get in. You weren't welcome in guilds if you were tent makers together, uh, but you didn't worship the god of the tent makers. You weren't welcome. And even as, just as part of being part of city life, if you didn't worship the emperor, you were a, a, a threat to the peace of the city. And so these Christians are living in this world and they're, they're just trying to get by and trying to figure out how to be faithful and how to worship God and they're start, starting to wonder that maybe it's easier just to accommodate. You know, maybe if I just, if I just worship Caesar so people see me one time and, and I don't really mean it, then it doesn't really matter and I can get by. That's the question that they're wondering in the midst of all this. And, and some have left the church. And some have fallen into idolatry. Some have fallen in uh, to moral sins. And it's with that background of the text that we start to understand Revelation. It starts to open up for us in new ways. And with these, rule, with these rules, then, we can take heart. There's a lot of moving bits to Revelation, and at times things will seem complicated, but you don't need to understand everything that goes on, every bit of the score, in order to hear the melody. Revelation is like beautiful music in that it can move you, it can, it can bring you all over the place emotionally, but there is a melody, and it's simply that nothing can stop the kingdom of God. Jesus wins. I want to just take time and explain how we'll tackle this. I'm going to take Sunday mornings to talk about the melody of the text. Uh, I, I want to, to get the big picture and hear the message that Jesus has for the churches. 
I want that to be really clear because this book is not just for our times or just for North America or just for the times in which it was written, but it is for the church universal. It has been a source of refuge and comfort for a long time. In fact, there are churches under persecution, and when you ask those brothers and sisters which book they turn to over and over again, it is often the book of Revelation that they love. You don't need to understand every detail to see this glorious picture of Jesus Christ. But there are some things that I would like to talk about that will benefit others of you that are more interested in sort of other parts of Revelation. I want to take on these discussions Sunday evening. And there I will talk about what it means that Revelation is a prophecy, for example, and how that helps us understand the book. Or what's it mean that it's apocalyptic or a letter and, and how does that help us with the book? What are the different approaches to Revelation? How do numbers work in Revelation and so on? And, I, and it's, just not, it's just not a good place in, in the morning service to be able to do that. And so I'm going to live stream every other week for that and this will start this week. So that will be focusing then, if we're thinking of the symphony, it's, it's fo focusing on the different instruments and different parts that don't always play the melody, but they're there in the background. They're the backbone, perhaps. So the question is, how does this particular issue contribute to the whole of Revelation? And so may, maybe you'll join me if you're interested. If not, I can do, just do it for my benefit, too. Back to Revelation, though, it need not scare us. That's really important. It need not scare us. Those of us who have been redeemed by Christ, it is a book of comfort and a book of hope. And so when we read the book of Revelation, that's, that's what we should feel. It need not intimidate us any more than any other book. In fact, we're encouraged to read it. In fact, it is good for the church to spend time in Revelation. Well, we picked this, I don't know, when we talked about maybe doing Revelation, maybe almost a year ago now, and, and it comes up now. And I always think that that's the providence of God. As a church, we're facing lots of different pressures. It's difficult to, to not be able to meet together. We want to be the church gathered, and this is not how it's supposed to be. There's a brokenness about this. We're trying to follow, but it can feel really difficult. Maybe some people I know that I've talked to feel like the church is being persecuted, perhaps. There are Christians who have been fined for, for meeting. But if we even go outside of our own context, we know that there are brothers and sisters in the world who, who undergo intense persecution. We know that there are countries where it is not safe to be a Christian or to gather at all. Uh, and we're not talking about $800 fines. We're talking about at cost to your life or imprisonment or whatever the case may be. As Christians, also, we're told that some of our views, the views of the Bible, are not welcome. We're told that some of our views are, are so offensive, and occasionally the idea floats around that the Bible contains hate speech. What will that mean in the future? What will it look like to carry around a Bible? And what will it look like to follow Jesus, to take up a cross and follow him? What will it look like when we have to make hard decisions about whether we will stick with God's truth or whether we stick with society's newspeak, as George Orwell called it? Will we accommodate where it's easy to do so? When the pressure's great, will we just, just say, hey, I'll do, follow along half-heartedly? Will we bend the knee despite the call for faithfulness? Do we feel that pressure? And as a church, maybe do we need to feel, be prepared for that pressure that's coming. Reading Revelation at, at such a time as this is good for us because first it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Those are the first words and they mean that it's going to show us who Jesus is. He is the faithful witness who remains true despite tribulation. He is the firstborn of the dead, the lamb who was slain, who by his resurrection ushers in the end times. And he now rules over heaven and earth and continues to meet his people and promises that his physical coming is not coming, but he will come again. That's all from first eight verses. When, when the church suffers, they need a picture of Jesus that can stay, sustain them. And I dare say that Revelation does exactly that. When the church suffers, they look to Jesus in Revelation and they can carry on. 
the picture of Jesus encourages the church to hold fast, stay strong, and don't forget that Jesus has already won. This is an important part of understanding the New Testament as a whole, in fact. I don't know um, if you know this, but the Jewish people expect that when the Messiah comes, that that Messiah, when he comes, will bring in this new age that will start and he will rule as the Davidic king and all things will be put under him and so on. And so that's what they expected and that's why they had such trouble with Jesus because he, he wasn't doing exactly what, he, what they thought he should be doing. Jesus comes and he says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the Bible. And that was hard for the Jews because they they didn't see the evidence of the kingdom of, of Jews ruling. They saw Romans over them still. But Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is here. It is in your midst. This is it. And with his death and resurrection, he inaugurates the kingdom of God. His resurrection, expected by Jews on the, on the very last day, on, on the day of the new age, is the sign that the kingdom has come. The time of already being in the kingdom then extends until s- such time as he comes again. And that means that we are between the coming of the kingdom and the fulfillment of the kingdom, in, between Jesus' first coming and second coming, and the Bible consistently calls that end times. For the last 2,000 years of the church, we have been in end times, the last days, the days, the time between. When we talk about the kingdom of God, then we talk about the already and not yet kingdom of God. It is fully brought in when Jesus comes again. We are in this last days. Jesus has died and rose again. He ascends. He's ruling over heaven and earth. But he will come again to make all things right. These are the last days. And and Revelation is a book for the church in the time between Jesus' first coming and his second. Second, it's a good time to read Revelation because it reminds us of who God is. The book opens with a wonderful Trinitarian greeting from God the Father and Jesus the Son and the seven spirits. Seven, when we look at that, that seems odd. Of course, seven is the number of fullness. And six days you shall labor. The seventh is a day of rest. In Jewish thinking, seven is full and complete. Uh, and so the, when seven is, the, is that number of completion, meaning the full power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That is a symbol. There are not seven spirits. We do not worship God, one God in nine persons. Right? It's, it's, it's obviously a symbol. Now look at that description of God. It is the God who is and who was and is to come. The name of God comes from Exodus. There's a reference to Exodus. When, when Moses is about to go into hostile territory, he says, he said that, who, who, who shall I say is sending me? And God's answer is, I am. When John is writing the letter to a church struggling with the pressure of the world around them, who is sending John? He who is. Notice that when that name of God is an insequential order. It's not he who was, like past, present, future, who was, who is, and who is to come. But the present is first. The God who is. A reminder that God is always present, no matter how hard, how tough, how tempted you are, how fallen you are, God is. And this God who is, is the God who was and is to come. He is the same God throughout history. He doesn't change. He isn't someone new. He is the same loving God that redeemed his people through the Red Sea, who made himself known to them as I am. The same merciful God that saved his people through the blood of the Lamb. He is the same loving God that has always been with his people, even in the most desperate of times, promising them not that that everything will be perfect and rosy and no one will ever uh, be hurt, but promising them that nothing can separate them from the love of God in Christ. When things are going off the rails and nothing seems to be going right, It's good to know that God is the same, that God is present, and that God is in control. 
That's a huge theme of Revelation. He is sovereign over history. He is sovereign over what happens to the church. He is sovereign over ha what happens in the world. He never loses control. Now, some of the images in Revelation uh, uh, are, and destruction of the book, they're, they're startling. And judgment might even be upsetting for you. But they're always in God's hands. And, and I think that our cultural time and situation makes that hard to understand sometimes. We live in a, a pretty easy life in a lot of ways compared to the rest of the world. But even just this, imagine that you were living in Nigeria in 2014 and you sent your daughters to the local Christian school. And that day, members of Boko Haram came and took 276 of your village's daughters. Do you remember that story? It's a long time ago, 2014. Today, 100 of those girls are still missing. Today, there are parents who have not seen their daughter since 2014. They don't know if she's dead or alive. They don't know what these, this group has done to them. And, and they are powerless to do anything about it. But to know, to read the book of Revelation and know that God judges the wicked is some solace there. To know that evil never wins gives some comfort. To know that they can never be separated from the love of God that is in Christ no matter what happens to them is comfort. The judgment of God is comforting to those who are persecuted and powerless. It's to know that God will take care of it. That God is in control. He is, he was, he is to come. Hold fast, take heart, and be encouraged. Reading Revelation is, is good for us because we are promised a blessing for reading it. Blessed is the one we see. Let me see. I got behind myself there. God promises to bless us through reading it. And so we read the, these words right there. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John is saying that what is written in here is something that you need to know for living in, in now and take it to heart now. The time is near. It's soon to take place in his time and our time. This is the only book, though, that has such a great promise of blessing. Isn't that great? This is further encouragement for, that you and I may not understand everything that John heard and saw, but we are going to be blessed by going through it. We will be blessed with, under, with, with understanding it. And I think we'll be blessed by being rebuked by it when it calls the, out the sin of the church and of individuals in the church. We will be blessed by having these images in our heart. We will be blessed by seeing heavenly worship. We will be blessed because it, it gives us glimpses into to God's hand and his control. We will be blessed because we will see that we are part of a huge body of Christ from every tribe and nation uh, worshiping God together. We will be blessed because we will see Jesus in this book and we will see his love and care for us even while he calls us to faithfulness. Friends, the time is near. It was near to John it's near to us. And Revelation will show us Jesus and his love for us. It will show us God, the God who is, and his providential care of the world. And it will bless us as we seek to worship this incredible God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this introduction to Revelation, these opening verses which remind us of so much. Lord, we, we long to see you and to know you in this book. We thank you that we see a God who is. And despite the chaos and, and the circumstances in the world around us, these things are still in your hand. You are not losing control. And we thank you that you promise blessing. Lord, we pray that, that as we read through this book, that our hearts would be stirred to love you and to walk in faithfulness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.